Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this latest teaching session in the course on technology and the future of medicine. Today, Ross Lockwood is giving the main presentation on the promise and perils of nanotech. I just have a few remarks about this fascinating collaboration that begins today uh, with students at Semmelweis University Medical School in Budapest, Hungary, the only other course sort of like this one. They have a course on disruptive technologies in medicine. Um, at their end, if their teams of two set up successful uh, collaborations with our teams of two, uh, the succeeding teams are excused from the final exam. Now, of course, we don't have a final exam, but at their end, they, they do, and it's a really big deal if they succeed. So this must be set up so that it's voluntary for you guys, positive and fun. And if it stops being fun, stops being productive, stops being uh, positive, then that means that that particular uh, collaboration is not working and you don't have to keep trying to make a failing collaboration work. But I think these are pretty interesting people at the other end, just like you are at uh, this end, so the likelihood is that there's a good chance that the uh, uh, collaboration will work. Now you're all dying to know what you get at this end if the collaboration works, and I've been in that situation of having to give gifts to the s students before. It's a tricky business, you know. Don't want to give something that seems totally worthless. Don't want to give something that's questionable and being very valuable. So these Android mini collectibles have been the things that I've been giving as gifts to the students over the years. And if you don't like things like that, I guarantee you there's somebody else in your life who does and you can re-gift it to somebody else and they'll be like so happy. So anyway, that that's that's what you will get if you're part of a successful collaboration. Now, how are we going to create five teams of two when there are only nine of you? Well, <clears throat> I'm going to bring to your attention the William Parker facet of things. William Parker is the most active medical student in this course. He's the guy who's giving his presentation on Future Day, March 1st. And I think one of you could claim him as a part of your pair, and that way we would have five pairs. And there's also Adam Mildenberger, who is another medical student, somewhat less active, uh, but he is kind of the uh, backup if we need one. So there are indeed 10 people at this end and 10 people at uh, that end. So if you could email me and let me know which theme you would like and if you've identified the person in this class that you'd like to partner with, um, and I, I will uh, attempt, I, I told I, uh, Bertolin Metzko that I would uh, give him uh, some feedback uh, this evening of how, how this is going, so, so I hope that I hear from some of you on, on this. This is not intended to be burdensome. It's not a mandatory thing. If it really looks to you like it's not something that you want to do, that, that, that is another way in which these you know, collaborations can not uh, succeed. If we're rewarding the, success, the successful ones, it should be that it's not a, you know, uh, uh, guaranteed success. What will the collaboration be? Um, I think that's to some extent up to you. No one in the world has ever done anything like this before. It's like a lot of the other things in this class. So whether this is a, just a superficial thing where you just uh, get to know the other guys a little bit or whether you're making a lifelong friendship here and, and uh, it's a, a deep and abiding thing. Um, so the um, uh, themes then, as you've seen, 
are these five ethical dilemmas due to the use of augmented reality such as Google Glass by medical professionals, robots in medical settings, pros and cons related to the human touch. Uh, Ian has already chosen that, so if one other of you likes that, you can pair with uh, Ian on that topic. What are the limits of using artificial intelligence such as IBM Watson in medical decision making, how to prepare for the medical 3D printing revolution, and finally exponential technological advances in the traditionally structured medical world, obstacles to overcome there. Here is what their Facebook page looks like. It's uh, facebook.com medtech course. And uh, the page just started today because their course just started uh, today. And I don't know too much about the people at the other end. Here's what their lecture hall looks like. It's sort of similar to ours in size. Uh, much older and not as good lighting. I'm sure their AV tech is a less skilled person than Angus. <laughs> anyway, we've got a lot of technological advantages, but they have more history, more uh, historical things have occurred in that room than have occurred in this relatively uh, young room. And what do the students look like? Here is uh, Bertolin in green, surrounded by some of the students at some uh, award ceremony. Uh, so that's what some of the people at the Budapest end look like. And here is Bertolin with his wife and another family member. So anyway, that, that's sort of all, all I know about things at their end. But I think this, this could be very interesting and, and I hope you're willing to take part in it. Any burning Questions about this? Do you understand what I'm a asking both to choose a theme, and if you can, find a second uh, student in the class to uh, join you in that theme. But I can uh, facilitate the creation of these five teams and um, also the interaction with uh, William Parker or uh, Adam if we need him. So any questions about that? Please uh, email me your thoughts. And uh, you don't all have to take part. It, it, it's not a required thing. It should not be onerous, burdensome. It's intended to be fun. OK, if there are no questions about that, we'll go on to Ross Lockwood's lecture on promise and perils of nanotech. Ross, take it away. Perfect. Now, just before I get started, I wanted to clarify that this lecture was originally given by Michael Woodside, and today I'm giving it to you on behalf of him. So I, I didn't construct this presentation. I merely reviewed it, watched his last lecture, and I'm here to give it on his behalf. But before we go into that, I wanted to do a little bit of follow-up from my lecture last Tuesday. So um, one of the big questions was, how do all these little micro electrical mechanical devices and these miniaturized computers actually affect us? And uh, a couple of things that I wanted to show you were the camera that I bought yesterday, the camera that I bought on Sunday, I should say. Um, it's uh, two years old, actually. It's the Olympus EM5, and Olympus just announced the EM10. So this camera has some really interesting uh, micro electronics inside of it. And I've got a little video up here demonstrating one of the features that this camera has. And it is merely a, a five axis sensor. So this is pretty standard in most DSLRs and micro four thirds cameras these days. Hey there, it's Zachary Gadget. And what we're so we don't actually have to have the sound on, but if you watch, you can see that the sensor inside the camera, this is the mechanical apparatus, can move in five different ways. It can move back and forth, left and right, up and down, and then it can tilt in two different axes. So in total, there are five ways that this sensor can compensate for the motion of the user. So if you're holding it still like this, um, but you're riding on a bus, it's moving a little bit, the sensor will actually compensate for that motion, and you get relatively clear images. So I took an image um, just yesterday in the lab, 
in uh, zero light conditions. So in our laser lab, I just wanted to take a picture of the setup. And it was a two second exposure that normally you wouldn't be able to take just holding it in your hands. You'd like to have a tripod for that. And with this sensor, I got a reasonably clear image um, just by holding it in my hands. And that's a complete, you know, that's a two second exposure. So that's one example of the way that that kind of technology can, uh, can, can help us in our day to day lives. And remember, that's two years old already, and that technology had existed. We just don't see it in everyday life because it's packaged up in these neat, neat things that people don't often consider fully. The next thing I have is this little toy. So this is a little quadcopter toy. And it has, again, one of these microelectrical mechanical devices that um, knows its orientation. So this one doesn't have a compass uh, like your phones do, but it does know uh, what angle the quadcopter is at. And in addition to that, it's got a little microcomputer on board that will compare the angle to the controls that I'm feeding it and it will compensate. So it'll, it'll stay level if I, all I do is throttle it up, it'll stay dead level. The drift is a calibration issue that I could fix, but as I give it controls, it stays mostly level and it just responds to the controls I'm giving it. So imagine this 10 years ago and what it might cost and ask yourself, okay, what do you, think you, what do you guys think this costs today? I throw out a guess. Yeah, exactly. It's $50. So in fact, it was on sale last night when I checked for $33, that version. And there are versions now that can carry uh, low-res cameras, admittedly low-res. There's even a version that carries a low-res camera and a transmitter and has an LCD screen on the controller so you can watch from the perspective of the flyer up to 30 feet away. So you could you know, fly it out into the hallway and down the hallway and, and in through the next the other set of doors here. Um, and that's all, you know, sub $500 technology. And, you know, it, I think the big question of why we don't see a bigger impact of this technology in our lives is a, is a maturity issue. That we're at the stage where all this new tech is flourishing and it's being integrated in things that we, you know, have known for a long time, like cameras, like remote control devices. It's going to take a little bit of maturity for those devices to to be integrated into new technology. So before, I, I'll give you an example of that, and I just pulled this up. I, I saw this literally minutes before I came here, and, and here's one of these products that I, I consider kind of one of these maturity issues. So let me make that the right size. So this just came out today, the Dash. At least I think it did come out today. It looks like it's three days old on Kickstarter, at least. The Dash is a wireless, smart, in-ear headphone. So these are headphones that are not connected by wires. They work uh, using Bluetooth. And in addition to the regular things that you expect from earphones, they have a built-in 4 gigabyte MP3 player. They can also do things like, uh, let's see if there's specs here. Uh, they can track your heart rate. They can track uh, the motion. So all of these little things that we've been talking about, these microelectrical, mechanical devices, they're being integrated into something that can fit into your ear and, and operate like that. So this is maybe one step towards what I consider this more mature technology, the technology that's integrating all these things and doing things that traditional earbuds don't. And that's all I have to say on that. So let's go and start discussing the lecture. Okay, so uh, we got a little bit into technology and its foundations, and in the lecture today, I'm going to be discussing kind of what the definitions of modern nanotechnology are, and a little bit of the history, which we did cover. Um, nanotechnology will obviously have two sides that we need to discuss, uh, the promise and the peril. And we've kind of already been pretty optimistic in what we've discussed as far as how technology can benefit us. So uh, we'll also go into a bit of the fears that, um, that we have in society today about nanotechnology. Um, there are some constraints to the promises that we have. So we'll temper our optimism a little bit on that end. And we'll save topics four and topic four again, should be numbered number five there. Uh, for our discussion on Thursday. So, 
just to get started, what is nanotechnology? And nanotechnology, as you're probably already aware, has many definitions. It can range from uh, silver nanoparticles in socks to more of the actual molecular machines that we'll be discussing today. So two possible definitions here. Nanoscience is the study of phenomena and manipulation of materials at atomic, molecular, and macromolecular scales, where properties differ, differ significantly from those at a larger scale. So um, that's pretty straightforward. The next one, nanotechnologies are the design, characterization, production, and application of structures, devices, and systems by controlling the shape and size at the nanometer scale. So in general, when we're talking about nanometer scale, uh, we're talking about the manipulation of atoms. If you look at a benzene ring, uh, the six carbon ring, uh, you, that's about half a nanometer in size. So when we look at some of these diagrams that are showing packed atoms, you can think of maybe two to three uh, atoms across to being about half a nanometer. Uh, and so when we're, so nanotechnology just refers to that scale of manipulation. So this is a Drexler-Merkel differential gear that was proposed in 1995. Uh, at the moment, I don't think any such structures exist other than in some biological systems, but there's nothing like this differential gear in a biological system. What we'll see is that as far as nanotechnology is concerned, the most mature nanotechnology that we have available today is biological nanotechnology. And that's one of the ways that, that nanotechnology is progressing. So, Here's the uh, quintessential slide of any nanotechnology talk. It uh, is the one that I discussed in, in great de detail in last week's lecture. There's plenty of room at the bottom. And again, it was addressed to the American Physical Society in 1959 by Richard Feynman, and it described essentially what became the foundation of nanotechnology, how uh, the focus of science in the 1950s had been mostly in terms of solving electrical and quantum phenomenon, but no one had really been miniaturizing things. And it may, it may be worth pointing out that as far as, techno as nanotechnology is concerned, um, the physics has existed for a century at least, and really it's been the realization of engineering um, technical achievements that have allowed us to progress in this field. So the questions that we have to ask ourselves are, how do we write small? This is one of the big ones that we proposed. And remember in 1985 that we finally got that atomic resolution writing that, uh, that Feynman first described in 1959. Uh, how do you store information on a small scale? Are you going to be manipulating magnetic domains like we do in current hard drives? Or is it going to be something else like moving gold atoms on a silicon surface? Um, how does, we already have this fascinating nanotechnology in our own biological system, so how does things like DNA replication work? How do uh, motor proteins work? And, and those types of things. And what problems will we encounter when we get down to the nanoscale? So, you know, when, when you've got a complex machine today, you use something like oil to lubricate it. Well, if you make those parts smaller and smaller, the oil molecules are getting larger and larger, so efficient lubrication at molecular scales just isn't possible in the conventional way. So how do you deal with things like friction and heat dissipation when you don't have a medium like oil to, to take care of those problems? And finally, how will we be rearranging atoms? So the popularization of nanotechnology really came again in the 1980s, just shortly after the uh, atomic writing was achieved in a book called Engines of Creation by Eric Drexler, and that was published in 1986. And it was influenced by, um, I have some notes here, by some of these Malthusian ideas that if you've got finite resources, uh, how, how do you achieve things like exponential growth? Or what are the limits of growth in a finite world? And it really brought forth this idea of molecular nanotechnology. So actually constructing molecules in an engineered way and having them do uh, specific tasks. So, oh, now I have to apologize here. I, when I reviewed the lecture note, uh, the lecture slides, they didn't have the builds in. So I, I don't know what appears 
in a slide, so I'm kind of uh, trying to improvise as we go along here. There was some controversial, controversial reception to these ideas, and as you guys probably know, some of the science fiction ideas that came uh, about as far as nanotechnology are concerned, are, are some of the, the bad aspects of nanotechnology. So uh, there were some debates in 2001 and 2003 between Drexler and Smalley on this, and it really had a big impact on public perception at the time. So what are some of the promises of nanotechnology? Um, obviously, new materials can be enhanced with properties like strength, durability, and functionality. And one of the really interesting examples of this is a, a very old example, is uh, colored nanoparticles. So you may be aware um, that stained glass windows actually have some aspects of nanotechnology in them, and that's existed for a long time. Uh, one of the earliest examples of the use of nanoparticles comes from a fourth century Roman artifact called the Lycurgus Club. Uh, sorry, excuse me, let me say that again. The Lycurgus Cup. So if you're on Google right now, that's L-Y-C-U-R-G-U-S. And it's uh, one of these really interesting things that at the time they had no idea how they were getting color from a glass with a mixture of gold and silver. And when you examine something like that on the nanoscale, you can actually see that the gold and the silver in those mixtures form nanoparticles that affect the optical properties of those systems. So the Lycurgus Club, oh, sorry, I keep mispronouncing that, is, uh, is called a dichroic glass. It actually looks green in reflected light, but it will look red in transmitted light. So it has vastly different properties depending on the lighting source that you have, whether it's behind it, in front of it, inside of it, or outside of it. And that all goes down to the actual nanoparticles that are there. Um, in the image in the center of the screen there, you can also see that there's colored nanoparticles. So the ones in, in this example, they're cad cadmium selenide quantum dots. And depending on which size you make them, you can make them range uh, in emission from deep blue all the way to uh, orange and red. And this is what my personal uh, background is in. So instead of cad selenide, I study silicon quantum dots. And mine typically are red, but you know we can push them into the blue, it's just that the things that I study, it doesn't really matter what color they are. Um, one of the uh, other interesting things that was proposed uh, by Arthur C. Clarke is a space elevator. So you guys may have heard of this concept of putting a satellite in geosynchronous orbit and tethering it there with some super strong material. As it turns out, steel isn't strong enough and neither is titanium, but, and I, I think this is just mind-blowing, there is a material that exists that could be strong enough, and that's carbon nanotubes. So carbon nanotubes are uh, basically a graphene sheet, a single monoatomic layer of carbon that's been rolled up in a particular way, and they have more tensile strength than steel and titanium do. So it's conceivable that if you could create 70 or 80 kilometers worth of these carbon nanotubes, you could use that as a tether from a ground station, to uh, an, a satellite in geosynchronous orbit and then run an elevator up and down instead of expending rocket fuel uh, and having, you know, basically putting an explosion beneath you. You could use two satellites as, or two elevators as counterweights for each other and send them up and down with minimal energy just, to, just enough to get the, uh, the mass that you're, you're carrying up and down. Um, the trouble is with some of these things, as we'll see later on, that it's very difficult to make any length of carbon nanotube. So one of the techniques that they're using to try and mitigate this is by, by weaving this nanotube yarn. So taking all these millimeter length carbon nanotube strands and weaving them into uh, a, bigger, a bigger strand. Unfortunately, that doesn't have the same tensile strength uh, as just one single carbon nanotube. But we're getting there. Uh, other possibilities, the invisibility cloak, so made from uh, nanostructured materials known as metamaterials. You can create things that have negative index of refraction, which will cause light to bend in the opposite way that you'd normally expect it to bend in, in a similar material, but not a nanostructured material. And these things can be used to effectively hide objects. So in the microwaves, these have been demonstrated and we're getting more and more 
uh, devices that work in the visible range. So on the right-hand side there, you can see a sheet of carbon nanotubes, which if essentially are rendered invisible when there's an electric current passing through them. And then, of course, there's things like diamondoids, so um, heavily engineered materials that you could imagine being used as coatings on ball bearings uh, to reduce friction. And uh, I don't know too much about diamondoids, so we're going to skip that. <laughs> and this is another thing that came up. So um, some nanotechnology implementations have already really come to fruition. As, as you guys know, the quantum computer, we talked a little bit about the D-Wave quantum computer. And I'll, ha I'll just say a little bit more about what, a, what the benefits are of quantum computing. So when we talked about classical computers, the ones that, are, that we have in our phones and, and computers, we talked a lot about linear processing. You can think of a quantum computer as a processor that can evaluate many different things in parallel. So it's a, it's a massively parallel computer. And some of the problems that quantum computers are really good at are things like factoring large numbers. So when we talk about um, NSA surveillance, they may be using, and we don't know, uh, they may be using something like a quantum computer to break in encryption schemes. But there are problems that we can all familiarize ourselves with that, that are also very difficult for conventional computers to solve, but easy for quantum computers to solve. And one of, them, one of the most famous ones is the traveling salesman problem. So if you have a number of destinations on a route and you want to plot the shortest distance between all of them, uh, that becomes very hard every time you add a new destination because you, you get basically the number of nodes in that network times the number of nodes that were in it before uh, more complexity. So if you've got 34 cities and you add a 35th one, you've got to compute all the different ways you can get between them and add all the different ways you can add that, that 35th city in there. So quantum computers, as it turns out, are actually um, very good at these types of things. And we're just beginning to see uh, quantum computers on the market. So the D-Wave system, there are some limitations as far as whether or not it's a true quantum computer because it uses a method called adiabatic quantum computing. Um, but the interesting comparison with quantum computers today are, if, if you look very carefully, you can see a man in the, in the picture in the bottom left. And he's you know, about half the height of that quantum computer. So the quantum computer right now is the size that computers were in the 60s and 70s. And if you just did the naive thing and extracted, extrapolated from the history of classical computers, the history of quantum computers, in 50 years, a machine like that may fit inside of our pocket. Uh, another promise is something called the utility fog. So this is like a nano fog of little nanobot-sized machines that can uh, basically serve as general purpose building materials for things. And uh, one of the examples of uh, an actual device that exists is the Smart Pebble robots by MIT. So uh, these ones, oh, here we go. Sorry about that. These ones are copying a template on the left-hand side and then using themselves to generate a copy of, of that structure. And so you can imagine that this would be maybe the basis for something like a replicator or, or a general purpose machine that can reconfigure itself uh, to serve a new purpose, you know. Uh, a wrench on an articulated arm could turn into a screwdriver or something like that. Then, of course, uh, when you throw sensors into the mix, you get things like smart dust. So these, are, these could be things that are wirelessly network connected, and each individual sensor could have its own processing unit. So the analogy here might be the connection machine that we talked about last week. Only in this case, uh, if you throw into the mixture the wire wireless network connectivity, you kind of go around the problem that uh, we talked about, about that 16-dimensional architecture, where each processor has to be uh, connected through a route of circuits to another one. If it's a wirelessly connected protocol, then you could imagine with sufficiently advanced technology uh, being able to just address one unit to another one and actually be more connected than having a physical connection like the neurons in our brains do. Combine that with uh, artificial artificial intelligence, and you get uh, swarm intelligence computations. So uh, 
immediately reconfigurable computers that can repurpose themselves for new tasks. Um, I actually brought the quadcopter down because I noticed that this uh, slide was in here. So another promise of nanotechnology is the ability to, to make these sensor packages small enough to be deployed. You know, Feynman talked about dust size, but what we're seeing today is these handheld size drones that can be, can be deployed. And, uh, you know, this is a toy, and it's $50. So what will we see in, in 15 years? Um, and then finally, like a more general purpose notion of this is actually creating nanobots that have molecular assemblers. So being able to build something from atomic constituents, to let this nanobot go in a, in a medium and have it build copies of itself and reconfigure itself as it's being built. So one of the big questions that you guys asked last time was how does this fit into the theme of the course, which is technology in the future of medicine? Well, these nanobots could es essentially be used uh, to do a number of things inside of the human body. So uh, a nanobot could conceivably take drugs straight to cancerous tissue and deploy them there eliminating all the toxic effects that you get in, in chemotherapy. Um, you could use these nanobots in distributed sensing networks and real-time monitoring networks and do in-situ diagnostics. Your body might know before you do if you've ingested a poison or if you've fractured a bone, and it might alert you to the fact um, just by being basically aware of how your body is... Uh, uh, what the state of your body is. Uh, it could be used to enhance your immune system, so nanobots might uh, replace or enhance white blood cells at fighting infections, at fighting viral invasions, and this kind of a thing. It could be used to diagnose and cure diseases in real time. Uh, it could interface with neurons and expand human mental capabilities. So imagine having, instead of just neurons connected, the way they are right now, having that wireless capability between neurons. So instead of having a thousand connections, each neuron might have a million connections and be more able to, or you might, might have a faster ability to reconstruct memories or have more in-depth memories. Uh, cellular repair and what comes straight out of that is human longevity. So what happens when you can go in and change the length of a telomere at the end of a DNA strand? you essentially can, you, you might essentially be able to go in and reverse the signs of biological aging and have, uh, for lack of a better term, immortality. So these are some of the promises. And let me just get back on track with my notes here. OK. So there is some motivation be behind these things. I'm going to just go through all the builds so you can see this all at once. So uh, some of the motivation for this molecular-style nanotechnology actually comes from biological systems. And we see it in our own bodies. And we can see it when we study things like uh, molecular biology. Biology really is providing proof of the feasibility of nanotechnology, that we can take things like linear encoded strings of DNA and turn them into machines like proteins, and that those proteins can do work, and that they can uh, act on other biological agents in systems uh, like our body. Um, by their very nature, they can self-replicate. And this is one of the primary reasons why they're such a compelling system to study as far as nanotechnology is concerned. Because when we want to build something on, a, on, a, on the nanoscale, we aren't going to be building one item atom by atom. We ideally want to be able to build them uh, multiple copies at the same time, tr copies that can make further copies of themselves. We want to have that ability to self-replicate intrinsic in the structures that we build. Otherwise, we're going to be sitting there for trillions of years, putting atoms in one at a time, and you know, doing the kind of watchmaker-style nanotechnology building. We want them to take care of it themselves. So this is why biology is such a compelling system to study. Um, of course, the machines that we build and the machines that we see in nature don't violate any of the laws of physics uh, as far as we understand them today. And that's one of, the, one of the really interesting things about the materials we talked about earlier, those metamaterials, is that those are not violating any of the laws of physics, but they're 
uh, they're using some really interesting principles in physics to kind of reverse the expectations of what we, what we normally expect materials, how, how we expect materials to beha behave. Um, so this bottom-up fabrication is conceivable even starting from the atomic level. And we see structures in nature where atoms are arranged precisely. So the, the biological system is a proof of principle that we should be able to build nanoscale, self-replicating, programmable assemblers capable of manufacturing arbitrary objects from atomic constituents. The proof is in the pudding. Um, the basic concept of molecular nanotechnology uh, was written by Drexler, so thorough, inexpensive control of structure of matter based on molecule by molecule control of products and byproducts of molecular manufacturing. So that's molecular nanotechnology in a nuts nut nutshell. Uh, it's based on the concept of the molecular assembler that could pick up and manipulate individual atoms and establish chemical bonds between arbitrary atoms. This is something that will come up in, in a few slides. The idea that when you're manipulating single atoms, you're actually manipulating the, the, those single, singular chemical structures as well. Um, incorporating these assemblers into self-replicating machines, so uh, making new copies of them, and molecular scale computation, programming, and data storage. This is, this is one of the big challenges that we're going to face in terms of nanotechnology. How do you program something that's built out of atoms to do particular actions? How do you communicate with that device? Uh, how do you get it to uh, send you back information? So all these things are challenges that haven't really been solved. So the promise of molecular nanotechnology comes from the Zyvex homepage. I'll just read this out loud. Imagine a manufacturing technology capable of making, ma making trillions of tiny machines, each the size of a bacteria. Each machine could contain an onboard device programmed to control a set of molecular scale tools and manipulators. An individual machine could be designed to manufacture superior materials, convert solar energy to electricity, or even ultimately enter the body to fight disease and aging at the cel cellular and molecular level. Materials hundreds of times better than today's best materials, vastly more powerful computers, precise machinery that don't wear out, and a revolution in clean manufacturing are but a few of the predicted benefits of applying these new machines. But many potential dangers lurk. So let's talk a little bit of the perils of nanotechnology now. And this is something that we're dealing with on a daily basis. So if you actually go out right now and you, you find something that has nanotechnology on the packaging, it's not likely that it will have any warnings about what the possible reper repercussions of that. So if you get uh, silver uh, nanowire imbued fabrics that uh, have uh, antimicrobial properties, they may not warn you about the, the possible dangers of, of using that technology. And, that's a little bit, that the, the dangers of those technologies are debatable, but as we'll see, some of the other things that are possible um, could be quite a bit more perilous. So new materials can easily spread uh, and be hard to contain. Um, imagine nanotechnology that is weaponized. How do, you, how do you control the trade? How do you embargo those? How do you verify whether those technologies are present, say, in, a, in an airport scanner? Um, and how do you clean up and dispose of them? When we talk about weapons, one of the examples that comes to mind is the landmine, which is a large device that, uh, though, though it can be hidden, is you know, this big around. So using detectors, metal detectors, uh, explosive gas detectors, you can find them, you can remove them at great expense, no less. But imagine instead that they weren't a foot in diameter, that they were a nanometer in diameter, or 10 nanometers, or 100 nanometers. Whatever size you choose in the nanoscale, those devices are, are going to represent a danger and be incredibly difficult to clean up. And then, of course, uh, one of the quintessential topics that comes up in nanotechnology is a self-replicating -repli weapon. So uh, this is an image from the uh, 2009 GI Joe, where metal-consuming nanobots 
are released on the Eiffel Tower and cause it to disintegrate. So the insidious dangers are the undetectable, uh, undetectable nanotechnology, uh, pervasive surveillance, and it, it's, this is coming up more and more as a theme in, in, in our, our day-to-day lives is uh, the totali totalitarian night nightmare of per pervasive surveillance. Um, if you guys want to read a really interesting story about this, there's a great Neil Steve Stevenson novel called the Diamond Age, where they have this nanotechnology fog of these surveillance robots that have tiny cameras and tiny searchlights, and they just float around in the air, and you actually breathe them in and breathe them out as you go about your day-to-day -day life, and they are just there as part of this governmental structure. Um, remind me what the name of that... Um, the book was that we recently, the, the trilogy. Old Man's War by John Yes. So Old Man's War is another example by John Scalzi of these neural interfaces. So in, in his novel, um, I don't want to ruin too much about it, but they're using these neural interfaces to augment your ability to, to think. And one of the most interesting things that, that I liked about that book was uh, inter interpersonal communication. So instead of me standing here in front of you and talking using sound waves with our mouths, what if we could just communicate brain to brain at the speed of light? Right? The, the, the implications it, that are, are um, explored in, in Old Man's War are really interesting, and it's really interesting to see how the characters deal with those uh, new technologies. Um, remote control of health. So the same nanobots that are there curing cancer what if they could be programmed to turn around and start attacking healthy tissues? What if your body could be held hostage? What if you got a virus uh, that attacked the, the medical nanobot system and demanded a PayPal payment of $100 before it would allow you to get better again? And what are the consequences of system crashes in these, with these enhanced bodies and minds? What happens when you get a blue screen of death in your augmented nanobot system. Is it as simple as reverting back to your biological structures? And that may be one of the reasons why in the next 100 years we don't see this kind of uh, nanotechnological implementation. Um, and then the last one there is, is a really interesting thing to, to ponder. What, what happens to the economic basis of society if someone who accrued a lifetime's worth of wealth could invest that in another lifetime, if they could extend their life by using these things. Then you have this really interesting stratification in socioeconomic terms where people who can't afford this life-saving technology end up dying, and that the people that can afford it live an extra lifetime with all their experiences and wealth and can continue to build it. So you get this really strange stratification in terms of how low and high class might function in the future. Of course, there's um, other high-level dangers that should be uh, explored. Societal fragility, so the consequences of network cr crashes in complex sy systems run by pervasive smart dust mesh. Um, you know, one example that Michael gave was how dependent we are on electricity today. So consider that 100 years ago, we didn't depend on electricity as a survival tool, that it was really a luxury. And today, it is really kind of central to our human survival. Think about how you would um, go about your day-to-day -day life if all of a sudden the, ele the electrical system just vanished. Uh, and it, it would be a, a real struggle for a population, say, the size of Edmonton, to live in the area the size of Edmonton without something like electricity uh, being used for heat and food processing and all the things that we take that we essentially take for granted today. And, and how will these interconnected nanotechnological systems uh, form a mesh like that? So there's a, the 2002 novel by Michael Crichton that explores some of these ideas called Prey. And there is a Wired article from 2000 uh, about swarm intelligence called Why the Future Doesn't Need Us. So let me just make sure I'm on track here.
So here are some other perils for you to consider. Um, we've already kind of talked about the metal, metal replicating nano, nanobots, but there are other forms that are actually more sinister in terms of humans. Uh, Self-replicating -re assemblers like the gray goo that, say, consume carbon could be used as weapons that would disassemble organic life but leave structures like the concrete framework of this building intact. Um, these self-replicating disassemblers could be weaponized to the point where, you know, I'm just going to take your city, so I'm only programmed to attack uh, human beings, or I'm only programmed to attack animal life, or I'm only programmed to attack crops, right? All these things are, are some of the perils that uh, are pervasive in our, in our notion of, of nanotechnology, but we really haven't seen any implementation of that yet. Um, and, and, and one of these things, you know, it's, it's even hard to imagine how this might happen, but evolution of those self-replicating machines away from their design purposes. So let's say in your body system you have these molecular machines that, that double as white blood cells. And what if they decide that they want to become viral in nature and they want to be contagious and they want to replicate into different hosts and they don't want to do what they're programmed to do and that once they're done with human beings, they work on dogs or pigs. And then after they're done with those, they work on the next set. And all the while, there's this machine evolution that's replacing and destroying uh, the framework of biological evolution. Well, as much as as uh, those sound terrible, there are some, there, there are some, some things we can discuss that, uh, that promise to intrude on those dreams. So even though we have biology as a template, there is not an obvious way or system of how we humans are going to design these nanotechnology systems. And just to give a simple example, the carbon, nano, carbon nanotube is an ideal electrical nanowire. That, so carbon nanotubes, even though they can, they can only be made millimeters long, uh, they're useful in dimensions of 100 nanometers as electrical carriers. And they're actually really neat because depending on how you click them together, and you know, as an analogy, if this is a graphene sheet of carbon, if I roll it up lengthwise, I might be making a conductor. But if I roll it up, Width-wise, I might be making a semiconductor. So you can immediately imagine that based on the configuration of atoms, you can actually make entire computers just out of this one single material um, and have a new field of research called carbon-based electronics. In fact, there are people that are doing this, kind of one carbon nanotube, two, three, four, five at a time, and building devices just based on these things. But again, the problem is, 20 years after we've discovered them, we still have problems growing them to the right size, to the right scale, manipulating the actual configuration, like I said, the way that you roll up the carbon nanotube. So it's not going to immediately replace what we have the best in class technology right now, which is silicon. And you know, we're pushing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven nines purity in terms of silicon in the order of the crystal, in the in the in the structure and and uh, the purity of the atoms that form a crystal of silicon. So while we have the basics for these things, it's going to take a lot of work to get them to the point where they actually compete with our current technology. And in the meantime, the current technology is going to progress forward as well. But as we saw, you know, single core processing speeds aren't growing uh, linearly like they were in the last two or three decades. So one of the dreams of the of this carbon nanotube technology is to actually build a carbon nanotube based uh, computer. And so you can see kind of that little mesh of carbon nanotubes there might represent something like uh, the component on a processor of a carbon nanotube computer. And just by virtue of their size alone, we'd already be reducing the size of current technology by 10,000 times. Um, and the same problem intrudes again. How do you interface that with the real world? If you, if you had a device that had a million connections the size of a grain of salt, how do you put a million connectors onto it and interface it with something like um, uh, a connector that would monitor your ECG? 
right? You've got to go from something that's on the macro scale to something that's on the nano scale, and all the while preserve the integrity of the information that's being passed through there. So to do it on a vast scale is still a problem that exists today. Again, yeah, this is the other thing. How do you check that it's built properly? What if one of the atoms is out of place and it changes the electrical properties of one of the carbon nanotubes in the network? That changes the whole behavior of the network. Um, we deal with some of these problems today in our in a modern microelectronics, and so there is some uh, error correction that we build into these systems. So it's conceivable that that's uh, that that's uh, that we can error correct these things. But you know, we say that these problems are just engineering and that they're just technical. And the trouble is that as much as we like to pretend that those are solvable, it's not obvious what the solution will be. And it's not obvious that we have a solution today that can work on technology that will work 10 years in the future. Um, so on a fundamental level, we have a flawed philosophical premise for molecular nanotechnology. Is it possible to build today anything that we can even conceive of provided that it does not violate physical law? And the answer is quite simply no, and it never has been. Um, one of the examples that we give is the dream of human-powered flight. So in 1485, Leonardo conceived of this human-powered ornithopter that would allow a human being to translate his muscular energy into, into flight. And at the time, Birds existed, of course they existed, so think, they knew that things could fly. They knew that there were animals that existed with muscles powerful enough to, to keep them afloat in the air. But it took 400 years for human-powered flight to become a reality. And in the meantime, the materials uh, that we developed were so strong and so light that they actually enabled this. It wasn't all of a sudden that humans became strong enough or, or that... Uh, that ornithopters became light enough that we could do this. In fact, in 1977, when it actually happened, it, the design is not an ornithopter. So uh, the things that we conceive of today may not even be the things that, that end up coming to fruition in the future. And it may not be for the applications that we see either, right? When we talk about airplanes, we're not talking about personalized flight here. We're talking about extensive travel, uh, commercial products being distributed around the globe. Um, but it really, when Leonardo came up with it, it was the dream of flying like a bird and seeing things from the perspective of a bird. And ultimately, this is one of the big factors that, uh, that we have to think about when it comes to nanotechnology. You have to, you have to respect the laws of physics. You can't just make a brand new material that behaves in ways that are completely unexpected from uh, the basis of classical physics. Um, this is one of the things that's stopping us from having faster computers is the heat dissipation problem. As something decreases in size, the density of components increases and waste heat becomes a problem. Uh, so as an example, if you made a carbon nanotube computer uh, with the same architecture and the same demands as a, a silicon computer, just the electricity flowing through the carbon nanotubes would heat them to the point where they would instantly vaporize. So you wouldn't even be able to turn on a computer with conventional architecture built to the scale of carbon nanotubes. Um, we mentioned this before, friction. How do, as parts scale down to near atomic dimensions, what acts as a lubricant? Uh, how do we control interatomic interactions so precisely that some atoms stick together whereas others slide and move freely? If you're gonna build a car with a buckyball wheels, you, you can conceivably make an axle out of a single carbon-carbon bond that would rotate freely, but how do you get the wheels to not stick to the surface that they're on? How do you get them to not form chemical bonds on that surface? So you have to precisely engineer the environment as well as the machine that you're building for you to get those, that kind of control. Um, fluctuations become uh, more important as size decreases. So as we know, like at room temperature, the atoms in the desk, in the computer that we're using, in the displays, in our own bodies, they have fairly large fluctuations as far as their size is concerned. So uh, when we talk about cooling things down to reduce, uh, I mean, when we talked about the silicon surface computers where we're plucking off hydrogen atoms and leaving behind uh, electron orbitals, those all happen at low temperature and at very high vacuum. So as soon as you introduce some of the real world scenarios, uh, you start messing up 
the, these nanotechnological systems. And then, of course, this is the big one. Quantum phenomenon become a huge problem. So if you start making transistors smaller and smaller, and you want to be able to gate a transistor open and closed to elect, let electrons pass through or not pass through, at some point, the gate is going to be small enough that whether or not the gate's open or closed, the electron can tunnel to the other side and continue on its way. So these quantum effects manifest as, you know, sort of this leaky behavior at the nanoscale. Now, for classical stuff, that's bad. But for these new technologies like quantum computing, that is the fundamental principle that, on which they're based. So there are some situations in which you can just flip your thinking and say, well, if we can't work in, in the classical model, let's switch to a quantum model and build things on that basis. Um, additionally, there are many pieces missing. So when we've been talking about this molecular nanotechnology for a long time, and it turns out that the field really already exists in the form of chemistry. And when we, we've been saying that, oh, you can just click atoms together however you like, well, as it turns out, you can't. You have to follow the basic rules of chemistry. So combinations of atoms and geometries are really constrained by, by the elements that are the constituents, right? You can't just take a nitrogen atom and replace it with a carbon atom. The properties of that molecule are going to change. Um, you can't make arbitrary structures and compositions, even though it's easy to, to draw something. So in this case, you know, if you click eight carbon atoms together, corner to corner, you get something that is uh, called cubane. But unfortunately, it's not a very stable structure. It's a, it turns out to be a fantastic explosive. And so, you know, if you're building these things, you have to worry about how they're going to interact with, with the thing that you're building. So we've, we've really kind of come around to the idea that biology as a template is uh, one of the most effective and efficient ways that we can go into this nanotechnology revolution. Um, you look at things like DNA polymerase, where you're, you know, replicating a DNA strand, and they have error rates as low as one in 10 billion. So just imagine, you know, how many times have you had to delete the word that you were typing on your computer? The error rate in your typing is, you know, one in 100 words, let's say. Um, we have to imagine systems where the error rate is, is lower than, than what we have in biological systems. Because even in biological systems, when you have that low of an error rate, you still can get some pretty tremendous, tremendously bad effects. Uh, this is a really interesting uh, molecular motor. This is known as F1, F0 ATP synthase. And it's the most efficient motor known. Um, it actually sits on the mitochondrial, I think it, it sits on the mitochondrial wall. And uh, it generates ATP for your body. And one of the interesting things to do is to compare its efficiency to that of an internal combustion engine. And right now, the, the estimates on the efficiency of this motor are between 90 and 100%. That means that there's very little, uh, very little energy that's lost to heat when, when these uh, motors are generating ATP. And your traditional... Uh, internal combustion engine, even though they're 100 years old, centuries old, still only get about 40% efficiency. So there's a, big, there's a big bridge that we need to gap to get, uh, to get down to the scales where you know, biology is functioning. Uh, so here, um, this is something that's even, even further outside of my realm. So I'll do my best to try and explain how things uh, work here. Uh, let me show you the whole slide. So when we're, we're using biology as a template, we're, we're taking a very simple process and, uh, and using that. So this simple process is, uh, is known as polymerization, where you take something like a linear chain of amino acids, and you rely on self-interactions for, for them to generate functional structures. So as you're, going, uh, as you're going up in complexity, you're actually starting with something like a linear chain, it folds in, in various ways to form the structure that you want. And this is all well and good if you have 4.6 billion years to sit around and, uh, and wait in this melting pot of you know, the history of evolution. But even today, we can't reliably predict folding for known structures. So we know the amino acid length. We know the crystallization. We know the... Uh, the diffraction pattern that is generated. We, we know how the molecule looks, 
but we can't reliably predict that the linear chain is going to generate that structure. Um, of course, we're getting better and better at it every day, but these are things that already exist. So take into, uh, take into account structures that don't exist, linear chains that, that are not biological, that, that we don't see in, in vast quantities. And you know, it's the traveling salesman problem all over again. As soon as you add a new amino acid, depending on where it is in the amino acid chain, you have this vast order of complexity that you have to deal with. And it could make a structure fold into some vastly different configuration. Um, so even though we are getting better at these things, uh, just the complexity of these problems are really tremendously large. Um, of course, yeah, this is another big problem. How do, you, how do you assemble these complex things efficiently and reliably without uniform and quality parts? So we're starting with, with atoms and molecules and amino acids. And as it turns out, um, even in biology, these, these processes are st statistical. So if you start with an amino acid of a certain length and a certain configuration, there's no guarantee you're going to get the protein that you want out. You could get all sorts of different uh, configurations of that protein that fall into some statistical distribution. And as it turns out, our bodies have um, some error correction. Um, so there's the ubiquitin pro proteasome system that, uh, that will disassemble proteins that aren't in the correct configuration. And this, there's a whole vast system that uh, that, that works with. Um, but any time you have a complex process, you need to have a reliable yield. So how do you build things with um, even 97% correct yield? And if you add multiple steps to the process, even if you add something as good as 97% correct yield, uh, you know, if you take 20 steps that all have 97% yield, you're looking at something where 50% of the products are worthless. So I'm going to actually skip this next slide. You guys, if you'd really love to hear Michael Woodside's take on it, um, you can watch the lecture that he gave last fall. But this is something where I don't feel comfortable explaining it to the level of detail uh, that he did. But Basically, what he's doing is he's just comparing uh, something like polymer dispersion to, to crystal purity. So the kind of control that you really need to have when you're making these nanotechnological systems is way up in the, on a logarithmic scale, up in the, in the range of 25 and 30. But let's skip that for now. So the solutions that we need to find to actually implement this kind of nanotechnology we want to be able to do it right in the first, first place, so having something like a strong driving force. This is what drives crystal growth. So if you've got some super saturated solution and you drop in a crystal seed, the crystals will grow in, in very regular order uh, because of the large driving force that, uh, that controls their, their dynamics. You can fix it later. So this is uh, um, some of the things that happen in our body when we're generating protein from RNA. Or you can have fault-tolerant architectures and simply ignore the problem. Uh, but you know, the difference there is you know, if, you're, if you're generating a machine that can alter your, cell, your cells in ways that produce longevity, is that really fault-tolerant to the, to the extent that you could let it run freely and not worry about it starting to deconstruct your cells when 50% of its products end up being uh, some unknown machine that you know, gets a taste for your blood. So practical nan nanotechnology, um, the stuff that we're working on right now is at the intersection of physics, chemistry, biology, and engineering. And we see it in day-to-day -day lives. Really, the stuff that we're building, there's this, there's this notion of the top-down approach where we take classical machines and we make them smaller. And then there's this notion of the bottom-up approach where we take molecular building blocks, and we figure out how they work together and try and build upwards. So biology is the bottom-up approach. The current kind of microelectronics revolution is the top-down approach. And uh, at one point, we won't be able to tell the difference between them. But as it, as it stands right now, um, we're working very good at going down from the top-down approach. Uh, specific examples of nanotechnology research in progress today, building structures by ma manipulating individual atoms. So this is like my research where we build quantum dots. Uh, again, in like that highly statistical process where it's fault tolerant because I don't care what color it is, right? 
I don't care how many atoms make my silicon quantum dot. I just want it to absorb laser light and shine it out again. Um, and using biology as a template for nanotechnology. So we'll talk about this on Thursday when we talk about biomotors and uh, it's a really interesting field called DNA origami and uh, synthetic biology. All right, so are there any questions that I can try and answer for you guys right now? So any questions? One thing I, I always found intriguing about Michael Woodside's first lecture was this idea that with complexity comes great uh, fragileness, uh, fragility. He, he regards modern life as being very much like that, like in the city of Edmonton, if you were asked, well, how many days food I is there in the stores and, you know, all that kind of thing, you suddenly realize that without the, you know, the, you know, transport systems that we're all, you know, dependent on, that we couldn't get along very well at all, that, 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 that our life is, is amazingly fragile, just that, you know, the system of trucks that brings in food is not going to stop, the power is not going down, but if any of those things did um, uh, happen, we couldn't, uh, you know, survive for very long. Well, uh, and a good example of that is, it, next time you're sitting in a car and you get stopped by a train at a crossing, do you feel frustration or do you feel relief? Because that train is literally carrying everything that this city runs on. It's carrying yes. the oil and the gas <laughs> and, the, and the food and all and the things the that you need products. are in that train. Yeah. You know, and when you're traveling on the highway, how often do you get frustrated because you get stuck behind a truck where you have to pass a truck in, in conditions where it's not ideal to pass a truck? You know, we, we don't see those things as the lifeblood of, of our modern day life, but they really are. Yes. Yeah. So, questions? Sometimes this priming the pump takes more. Than I can fly the quadcopter some more. <laughs> anyway, so my my idea was that um, you know the ruggedization, the making us more uh, robust because of the many different backup plans that there could be, that the more complex the society is, the more ways there are to, you know, to cope with things. But anyway, Michael never bought that. So, so the, the, so, yeah, yeah. I, I imagine that one of the ways that nanotechnology will, will be implemented in the short term is by having something like these passive, passive structures that you could use as a medicine, right? Like when we talk about medicine, we're talking about different chemicals and different proteins that we put into our bodies kind of en masse to um, interfere with certain receptors, certain neurotransmitters, uh, and they change the outward behavior of us and change the inward kind of chemistry of our bodies. And I think that one of the big ways that, that we'll see change in the next little while is actually engineering those structures. So you look at something like I said, folding at home where you've got this distributed computing network that does protein folding and we're getting to the point now, even in the department here, Jack Dzinski, has he talked yet this year? No. Is, is he going to? Yes, yes, he, yeah. he's giving uh, two lectures this year. Yeah. So where you're identifying sites on something like a biotin, uh, a biotin strand, and you're interfering with the growth of a, of a biotin chain. So you've identified the site, and what you want to do is you want to engineer something that fits into that biotin site so that that biotin strand, for lack of a better term, I, I can't remember the correct way to say it, but that it inhibits the growth. And, and Jack Dzinski has actually discovered and developed from, from these, like identifying the site that you want to interfere with, developed a drug that can interfere with that. And that allows you to do things like inhibit, inhibit tumor growth. So, you know, we're really kind of at the birth of a new era in terms of that kind of engineering where you're taking biological structures and you're, you're tweaking them ever so slightly so that they do what you want rather than what they want to. Right. You know, uh, Jack's lecture is an interesting example of the way that this course is getting better little by little that we, we decided to submit to peer uh, review the top five 
lectures in the course. You know, we got on into this self-praising thing where we we're talking about how great these lectures were, and you know, we kept telling ourselves that. Well, when we sent Jack's lecture out, um, I was always proud of how packed it is with, you know, details and, and exciting things. <laughs> he said, you know, this too much in this for one lecture. It should be two. So this year, it is two. So I think you'll like it a lot better rather than th this jam-packed thing. OK, well, there must be student questions now. So we, we've got uh, seven minutes. Yay. Um, I was hoping you could explain further about this, uh, this whole maturity thing that you were discussing at the very beginning. Are you talking about the maturity of our thinking, or is it just the maturity of like how far along the technology is? Because it appears to me that we're thinking about some pretty, pretty intense stuff that doesn't seem immature. Yeah. On the one hand, I think what I mean by maturity is our ability to identify a problem and to solve it with the technology. So a good example of this is 1984, when the personal computer really started coming out. What were people using them for? Right? The technology had not evolved to the point where you could watch movies or edit pictures, but you could do simple things like process Word documents and, and use spreadsheets. And spreadsheets were really kind of a fundamentally new thing where you could have live updating in a cell. Um, you know, If you're building a spreadsheet that has you know, your income and what you're going to be spending money on in the next quarter, changing a value over here and having it immediately be changed on the other column is a really fundamentally new thing. Normally, you'd have to sit down and work through all the different things that, you know, these long chains of equations and, and be doing, you know, pretty rote calculations by hand. But you look at what the personal computer is today, and it's true that it's still primarily used for word processing and for things like spreadsheets. But when I, when I say maturity, I mean that we can't really predict that we're going to be watching Netflix all the time. You couldn't even have said that three years ago. Uh, and, and, and I'm not saying that the personal computer is mature in any way in that sense, because it could be that you know, once everybody gets gigabit Ethernet, that Netflix goes out and something new comes in to, to change it. It could be you know, interactive movies or you know, just off the top of my head. I'm not the right person to ask because you know, nobody knows what the next stage is going to be. But another good example of this maturity that I'm talking about is the bicycle. And you know, when the bicycle came out, there were some variations in its design. You have the penny farthing. You've got the unicycle. But for, for all intent and purpose, the, the two-wheeled bicycle um, took very little time to mature in design and has changed very little over the 200 years since. And it's just as useful today as, as it was in the decades that it was first invented. So it's hard, it's hard for us to predict um, whether something's going to mature quickly and, and just, you know, like the bicycle, OK, now we've got bikes, great. You know, let's throw a couple of new materials at it, but fundamentally, let's not change the design. And the, the personal computer is maybe another example that's taken about as long. But you know, there's always a debate between, do I buy an iPad or a tablet computer, or do I buy a, lap book, uh, a laptop? Um, and recognizing that today, the, the tablet's not a mature platform, and that it's not a general purpose computing device. Like, I couldn't do a Mathematica simulation on my, on my tablet. Um, that's what I mean by maturity, that I'm not going to go out and throw my laptop out because iPads are in. Right? Even though I can do word processing and watch movies and do a bunch of things, things that we consider mature on one platform are not necessarily mature on the other. Um, but that doesn't mean that in 10 years my, my laptop will be completely superseded by a tablet. So I, I don't know if that actually gives you a better sense, but, but that's kind of what I mean, is that, that technology, there's, there's a path that it matures along, and it's hard for us to predict what path it will take. So who knows if you know, in, in 10 years all of our socks are going to have nanoparticles in them, FDA approved, of course. Does that answer your question, or do you have like, a follow-up that would clarify? No, that's nice. 
Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that cleared it up. OK. I, I guess part of the problem is that when you ask a question like that, that's not a discussion that happens very often, and it's not something that is academically rigorous. You know, when we talk about nanotechnology, we can say, here are the examples of nanotechnology. But when we talk about technological maturity, you know, who would be a good person to ask about that is the Dean of Arts who gave the talk. Is she giving a talk this year? Oh, darn. No. Perhaps, perhaps a good resource would be the, the video recording of Dr. McCormick's, Dr. McCormick's talk on the history of medicine. Hmm? Oh, sorry, Leslie Cormack. So something you're going to be dealing with quite soon, I guess, is the uh, possibility of uh, completely uh, modular life. Like if you go to Mars, right, with limited things, and then everything that you need must be made from those things. You know, the, the idea of molecular uh, nanotech, the Star Trek, you know, replicator where you just tell it to make something, if we really had something like that, then you could leave for Mars with, with, with very few specific things, but the possibility of, of a kind of uh, modular assembly of yeah. you know, anything that you would need, right? Yeah, there's kind of two parts that I'd like to address to that. Because, like, you know, so I'm leaving for the high seas simulation in 40 days. So March 21st or so, I'll be, right. I'll be gone. And the question is, how many, how many things in my life can I relegate to virtualization? So how many things can I digitize? I'm not going to be carrying a stack of books because I have a Kindle. And this is something that really blows my mind, because people every day, I say, oh yeah, I read on a Kindle primarily. If I can't read on a Kindle, I read on an iPad. But you know, I have a bookshelf at home that is slowly getting smaller and smaller as I find appropriate people to give those books away to. And I, I now have no desire to keep a physical book in my library at all. You know, people mm -hmm. say, well, I like having the big format books that I can flip through and look at pictures. I have an iPad. Even if it's not the same size, I can zoom in on the picture. I can bring up extra information. Like, the technology of the large format book is no longer compelling to me as far as having a coffee table book is anymore. Um, of course, you know, that is kind of bad to my guests, because the books are really there for someone to sit and flip through while you're, you're making them a pot of tea or something. Um, but so what things can I virtualize? And, and then what things can't I virtualize? So I can't virtualize a camera. Of course, I can use the camera that's in my tablet and my phone, but there's nothing close to the quality that a, a real handheld camera can use. And then what things can I build in situ? And that's where one of the right. studies that I'm going to be doing comes in. And, and we're going to be using a 3D printer, actually using 3D printed surgical tools, which you'll learn about when Julie Lin Wong comes to talk in in March. And um, rather than, than bringing a bunch of surgical instruments that you may never need, so, so you know, if you have 10 pounds of surgical instruments that you may never need, why not bring 10 pounds of 3D printing material and just build as you go? And you, you know, the possibility is there actually of recycling that material as well. So you could, you know, instead of taking 10 pounds of surgical instruments, take two pounds of building material. If they operate the same, then, then you're golden. So the question is, right. what can I virtualize? What can't I virtualize? And of the things I, I can't virtualize, what can I build on demand? Mm -hmm. So we, we can talk more about that uh, next time. We're out of time. Thanks for, for an excellent l lecture. Cool. Okay.